can see by my sort of subtitle that it it it, it fits what what we are and what we do. I mean, most when we're employed, we're in a place of privilege, but when things happen to us, it it, it turns bad. I mean, for most of us, life was great through much of the pandemic. We thought we had it made until we got that notice. And to add insult to injury, her laptop's away. Thus, the title of my talk, You've Been Laid Off, Now What? Actually, it's also what you can do to prepare, and at, at, at least per the plan, I don't know what's going to happen with this crowd, we were planning a second session at 3 o'clock based uh, solely for questions, because uh, there are things that I want to talk about that, I, I'm sorry, I don't want on camera. <laughs> Uh, if you want to copy the slides, he's, here's the URL for you. And basically, a, a habit for accessibility is to say HTTPS double slash slides dot com slash Mike dash one slash layoff dash recovery. And I also have a blog uh, on a personal URL, which I also use for uh, my credentials. I'm thankful to the people at Nginx, not only for hiring me, but also for giving me a chance. Based on my background, which uh, I'll talk a little bit about, this could very well be the best job of my life, and that's that's what I needed. I mean, as I, I've told you, I had I, I just turned 60 after my first, just before my first layoff. So let's move on to this short message from my employer. We will continue to offer our open source projects under accepted open source licenses. I'm not really sure what that means. You're welcome to read the rest of the slide. And, and I, I just started at Nginx at, just after Memorial Day, so I don't yet know enough about the policies to speak further. But what I do know, we do have plans to move our documentation towards open source, and that's part of what I'm doing here, learning what it takes. If you've gone through a similar transition, I'd love to hear more, especially if other parts of your company uses regular proprietary software. Are things coming through all right? Okay, great. Ah, I hear better now. Let's see, yeah. Time to talk about myself. I've been a tech writer for the past decade, but before becoming a tech writer, I wrote a few books. I've been using Linux since 1999, Red Hat 5.1 was my first distro. And yes, I loaded those off of floppy disks. I think some of y'all can empathize with my job history. After working for a single startup for seven years, I thought it was time for a change, which seemed reasonable in our industry. The search took me three months. The market was decent. A year and a half later, I was recruited. That was the spring of 2021. Everyone was hiring like mad. Then in January of 2023, the problems hit home. As I mentioned er earlier, I, I that layoff was four days before my 60th birthday. So that week I drained a bottle of scotch or maybe it was in two days. I, I, I forget. <laughs> I updated my basic credential Git repo. I put out 23 serious applications, got interviews with eight companies, and accepted an offer 53 days after my layoff. But the company wasn't the best fit for me, so I started looking again in the fall. And in hindsight, that may have been a mistake. I had to go back to my playbook. That second time, it worked a little better, and I actually ended up with two offers. And I love where I'm working now. And usually I have this slide for bigger crowds, but, uh, but since we are where we are, uh, let's just, uh, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, uh, let, and go around the room and tell me what, what your job function is. Uh, if I can call on people. I mean, basically, 
calling on people, getting an audience involved helps people get engaged. Usually if I'm not engaged, I'll check my phone and do other things. So let me engage you. Right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Great. Fantastic. Wonderful. Ah. So if I'm on a break right now, I'm just going to do a quick project for Rick. So what do you mean by the software testing? Sometimes a break is really just a break. <clears throat> I've been on many a job show, but I am mostly ITM today. ITM? What does that stand for? IT asset management. Wow. We need to know everything in your environment. Uh oh. I need to know <laughs> that sounds frightening. Don't. <laughs> Basically, I'm going around the room, so. Right. So, and thank you, everybody. I, the one thing we all have in common here at Fosse is that we're all geeks. So, based on my experience, and I really haven't read any of the quote-unquote books on what to do, so I've sort of blazed my own path, uh, and I've organized what my lessons learned into the following 11 categories. What happens when you're laid off? I mean, do you have the presence of mind to do anything but be shocked? I, I, for some reason, I was able to think, okay, what do I want for... For the layoff, I have to accept this, uh, and, and I found, well, I mean, in principle, you'd think everything is negotiable, and it should be, because companies want your silence. But the uh, practicalities is that it isn't, because if you, say, want a bigger severance package, they'll have to take it out of different budgets. The two things that I found were negotiable, were extended COBRA, extended health insurance, or, and, the, and the corporate laptop. Uh, yes, in, so, in some cases they want, want to take it away, but especially if you work remotely, there's an expense to that for them. So they may be motivated to give you, say, a discount or let, let you have the laptop. And why, why would they negotiate with you? I mean, especially if they just laid you off. They want your silence. They want to, They don't want people to know their, what they did, what they, let's just nicely say, the practices they have. For me, this is a sad one because instinctively, I don't like to, uh, go, quote unquote, go on the dole, but it's something that you, that, that you got to do to preserve your financial sanity, and that's uh, apply for an employment. I'm not a lawyer, but and the rules for this vary by state. I've been laid off while a resident at two different states. What I do know is the week you get paid is the week you can't apply, at least in Washington and Oregon. In most cases, I think maybe even all cases, states in the U.S., forgive me if, uh, I mean, I don't know anything about unemployment requirements outside of the U.S., they require that you search for employment. I've heard, uh, well, I mean, I've heard 
different rules if you are in a training program, so that makes perfect sense. Uh, when I've accepted a job, usually I'll say, hey, let, let me have a start date two or three weeks down the line. You can still collect unemployment during that period as long as you haven't accepted a second job. Uh, some, well, there was actually a case where I traveled out of state and, tr and tried to file for the week and it didn't work out because my IP address was in the wrong place. And, uh, and uh, as, the, as those of you who have been uh, unemployed for the longer term know, there's a limit to unemployment but because it, it's insurance, so there's a limited payout. And my disclaimer for all of this is, is that this is just based on personal experience. I'm not a lawyer. So once you do all that, it's time to regain focus. After you've emptied that bottle of scotch, you need to get yourself to work. Sometimes it happens with layoffs. If, if say, you're part of a union, uh, there, there may be provisions where you might be called back to work. If so, great, but that's pretty rare in tech. After my first layoff, a mentor told me, if I'm angry about the layoff, I should wait. Anger shows up in interviews, and if you're searching while you're angry, you're wasting your time. In addition, job searches are a full-time job. I spent nearly eight to nine hours per day on the search. Your first step is to set up your credentials. As I mentioned earlier, I do it in a Git repository. Honestly, I was thinking about sharing my GitLab repo credentials, but thought better of it. While I believe in open source, I'm me, I'm proud of me. I don't want anyone to clone me like Dolly the Sheep. But I think it's a great idea for everyone to add their credentials to a Git repository. It gives you a baseline to start your application. In mine, I have a resume, work that I'm proud of. For me, that's, uh, that's my list of books. For you, it may be something else like projects published in Git, but maybe even a series of, uh, of issues or PRs or whatever. It gives you a baseline to start your application. Wait a second, I just said, said that. But in any case, for, for technical writers, they typically ask for writing samples. I have them all at the ready in my Git repository. I can pick, pick and choose them. I can even share the Git repo with the potential new employer. It's good to ask for help. It's good to appeal to your network, but you need to go further. Networks today are large. I'm assuming that you use that other proprietary tool called LinkedIn. I'm connected to like 1,500 people. That sounds great, but 1,500 people, how many of them remember what, uh, what I do? I look at some posts and I think, really? You love the company that laid you off? <laughs> I mean, it's nice to share positive experiences from your time with the company. In fact, it's a good sign that you've let go of the anger. When you're searching, you want to be genuine. And do you include the open to work banner? That's a subject for some discussion. Personally, I've never done it. I've written posts that said, had the hashtag open to work. And then I sell myself. I don't just say, hey, if you got any leads, send them my way. I, I, you've got to say, hey, here's what I can do for you. So I set out a headline in my LinkedIn. I can help you create better docs. I shared the domain knowledge that I have. This is personal to me, I'm sure. You all have uh, things that sp are special to you, things you can offer, things you can, you can tell a potential new company, hey, I can help you solve these problems. I declared my domain knowledge. I created follow-up posts with, with my domain knowledge. And the advantage of that is that it, it helps me prepare mentally for interviews. 
it, it made me review, hey, here's what I've done in the past. Here's what I can do in the future. So within that, describe what you've done in some detail. Get recommendations. I, sp I spent maybe, uh, maybe, maybe 20 hours campaigning for a recommendation from a, a previous CEO of a startup that I worked with. Uh, the guy was receptive. He said, hey, hey Mike, it, as long as you pre-write it for me, I'll, I'll sign it and se uh, send it out if I agree with it. And, and he did that was great the bonus with uh, with all that as i think i just mentioned it helps you prepare for interviews and if you have interesting stories that can help you make an impact when you do your interviews for me this is my interesting story i'm a technical writer but once at one point uh, while we worked in an office i was asked to take over the uh, the server in the, in the lab and what happens when a tech writer does systems administration? Fun stories. I've been fortunate that I know a few hiring managers and they know me. But you don't need to know everyone. This is a difficult market. When you see someone who's hiring, look at their company page on LinkedIn. One advantage of LinkedIn is that you'll see if you're connected with anyone at that com and company. If you do, contact them personally, privately. They have missed, may have missed your announcement. I know when I open up my LinkedIn, I see what feels like hundreds of posts. I've never counted, but still. If someone you know is, is connected with their company, ask for their help. If not, do some sleuthing. It, in many cases, it's not hard to find the identity of the hiring manager and if you appeal to them well, they may be open to you. I've even done informational interviews with, uh, with other people, potential co-workers and the like. At times, I've given people tips on where to apply with contact info for people that I know. And my expectation is that they would go and talk to them first. But then a half hour later, I might, uh, might receive a response that says, thanks, Mike, I applied. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you've got to do your homework before applying. As shown in the talk description, the first time I was laid off, I put in 23 serious applications and I got interviews with eight companies. I how did I get there? I put in work into every application. Let's see here. And how, how do you do that? You, you study the job description. You, if possible, you customize your resume to say, okay, these are my skills that match the job description. Ideally, or more easily, it's, it, you should be able to write a cover letter, and I advocate a cover letter for every serious application that uses the words straight from the job description. If you're going through a filter, say, of an HR person, you want them to, to see, hey, I've read, read your job description, even though it might be a, I guess a nice way to say it, a, a less than perfect job description. <laughs> If you're applying to a company that does open source, you should be able to find repos. I've frequently contributed to open source docs in support of an application. And that's what takes so much time. Here's my comparison. If you have a generic resume and no cover letter, take the point of view of a hiring manager. It, it, he's going to look at you and say, hey, it's like you've got your eyes closed when you did the application. And to them, the application is going to look like this. Or even worse, an appeal from a used car salesman. How quickly is that going to turn them off? In contrast, if you do your homework, if you measure twice, if you study your target, if you put that info into a cover letter, if you include a portfolio that actually solves problems for that potential hiring manager and that 
takes some sleuthing to figure out, you at least have a chance to get to an interview. And one, one thing I should confess, uh, this particular image and the one before I generated off of AI. Next, be ready to scare your, share your schedule. I don't know if that was a Freudian slip. A job search is a full-time job. You want a schedule. You set up open hours on a calendar, 9 to 5 or whatever. You sync it to a tool like Calendly. If there's an open source alternative to Calendly, great. Many o open source calend or trying again, many open source companies are small. They may ask if they like your application. So, Mike, when are you free for an interview? It's not they may not have their own Calendly's. If you can show, show them a Calendly, you can show them, hey, I'm prepared, I'm ready for you, pick a time. And in your Calendly, do block off time. Not only do you want to focus time on researching on other companies, you want to show that you're not just appealing to them and say, call me anytime, day or night. Now for a topic with some controversy. Should you do the more than the minimum in your application? I think you already know my answer. Yes, I said four to eight hours. This question addresses when you should go further. Many companies actually pick new employees from their open source contributors. We're at Fossey, the free and open source software yearly conference. We can contribute. Many of us know how to contribute. When I contribute, I show what I do best. For me, it's creating clear and readable documentation. For you, it might be removing the spaghetti from code, creating unit tests, whatever it is that you do best. It might be for not for that particular company, but it helps keep your skills fresh. Now, ideally, you'll have some interviews. You need to prepare for those. That takes a lot of work, too. My points are beyond the uh, typical interview questions. There's a lot of great material out there on how to prepare for a typical interview. But based on the work that I've done before, when I prepared for interviews, I went through all the posts that I created. It gave me substance for stories to talk with uh, with a, a interviewer and my big tip here that, that that's really worked for me at least i think i mean i don't know the interviewer perspective for every interview i prepared a closing statement yes that sounds like uh, you're being a lawyer about this but heck when you're going into an interview you're being judged your interviewer Sometimes even a panel is your jury. You want them to think, okay, this is a, a summation why we should hire them. You want to make it as easy as possible for them to say yes. And when I've been on the other side of the, uh, the table, I think, okay, I've got to set up a report. Oh my gosh, he's given me a closing statement. I got, to play, got a way to start my report. If you can help the interviewer, they're more likely to help you. And after every interview, you should follow up. Even if they rejected you on the spot, say thank you. There are cases, and I'm familiar with some, or a friend, quote-unquote, where companies reject a candidate and then change their minds. Interviewers at many companies are overloaded. I've interviewed with companies who've talked to a dozen candidates. When I thank the interviewer, I cite something that happened in, in the interview that was good. I may I'd cover some things that might have been questionable, but that reminds them what you talked about. But be careful after that. Unless you have new information, Following up, at least too frequently, is like asking a potential new employer, are we there yet? You don't want to do that.
I hope you all get to this step. And when you do, it's okay if you want to take any offer. This is a difficult market. But if you have the courage to negotiate, be willing to be silent for a while. The person who speaks first gives more. And now to start to sum things up. To me, the key to getting a new job in this market, and actually maybe even in any market, is to show empathy for your potential new employer. They put out a job description because they need somebody. Why do they need somebody? They have some problems to solve. You identify those problems. You identify how you can solve them. You're empathizing with your potential new employer. And most people like that. Short version, you need an elevator pitch. This can also be the closing statement that you use for, for various jobs. And if you empathize, you know what that person needs. And I'm realizing I might be repeating myself a little bit, but re repeating myself usually helps people remember things. Even better, if you've done that work to empathize, you, the company that hires you or wants to hire you can start thinking, here's what the, the action plan that I can put in place for this potential new employee. I want to hire him because I know he can solve these problems. And with that, I repeat the URLs here, and as you've probably seen, this is essentially a, a two-session uh, two hour where I do my part and Jordan does his. So I, I will continue this on by introducing Jordan. Uh, for many today, full-time work is no longer working. With the changes coming because of AI, maybe it'll happen to more of us. We've seen some of that with Intel in the past day or so. There are some who suggest that AI will be able to set up the code for a user interface based on a Figma diagram. Could really hurt. So with that in mind, I've been paired with Jordan Hewitt, who's sharing experience with various techniques on the road less traveled, who can help you navigate how you might get experience and traction in this economy and keep your plate full of clients. And with that, I'm going to say thank you, and we'll take a couple of minutes while I transition this over to his, his slides.